It was in the morning newspaper. Hundreds of robins fell from their trees. They were lining the sidewalk, out on the porches. No one knew what happened. And when the ornithological officials came and conducted their research, they too were perplexed until one of them noticed the purple color on the edge of their beaks, and he put it together. It had been a particularly cold and frosty winter, which caused the grapes of Santa Rosa to ferment. So as they ate those grapes, they became drunk, and the alcohol content was so high that it killed the birds. Sometimes in life, we hunger and thirst for a thing, like a Santa Rosa grape. And it looks so good. It's so delicious. But how do we know if it's good or bad? If it's life-giving or if it is, in fact, a danger? Well, this morning, we'll get insight into that question by looking at Daniel chapter 5. If you have your Bible, please turn there to verse 1. Daniel gives us the wisdom we need as he tells this story of what happened to him later in his life. Daniel chapter 5 and verse 1. King Belshazzar made a great feast for a thousand of his lords and drank wine in front of the thousand. So 23 years have passed since the death of Nebuchadnezzar were transported into the future. We believe that Nebuchadnezzar's son took the throne but was quickly assassinated and then all kinds of political intrigue and subterfuge followed and eventually it was a figure named Nebuchadnezzar who took the throne. We think he married Nebuchadnezzar's daughter in order to strengthen that claim. But his ideas about religion were different from most people in Babylon. He wasn't so crazy about Marduk, the chief deity, and so eventually he moved northward. He remained king, but it was his son, Belshazzar, who occupied the throne in the capital city. So there's a co-regency happening. The two of them are reigning together, father and son. And it's helpful at this point to Take a few steps backward and see the big picture of what's happening in Daniel. It turns out that the first half of Daniel falls into this wonderful chiasm. That's the word of the day. Children, over lunch, I want you to ask your parents, what is a chiasm? And then they can impress you with it. A chiasm is is simply a literary structure that presents the points in reverse order. So think of it this way. You have chapter 2 and chapter 7 are alike. Remember chapter 2, that was the great big statue with the head and the chest and the legs, all of which represented different nations. Well, chapter 7 has something very similar. There's a colorful image that represents different nations. And then you look at chapters 3 and 6. They too are alike. Chapter 3, we have Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego thrown into the fiery furnace. Chapter 6, next week, Lord willing, we'll see Daniel put into the lion's den. And then in the center, you have verses 4 and 5. And there you have King Nebuchadnezzar, full of pride. He has to be humbled. And then our chapter today, chapter 5, is when uh, Belshazzar, the king, has a very similar experience. Chapter 4, chapter 5. So, Without further ado, let's look at this story, four principles for discerning what is good. Here's the first of them, beginning at verse 2. The good life, so-called, is very often rotten on the inside. Imagine the banquet hall. Archaeological excavations have told us there was, in fact, a banquet hall this large to contain a thousand people. Lord Byron evocatively describes it in his poem, Vision of Belshazzar. He writes, The king was on his throne. The satraps thronged the hall. A thousand bright lamps shone o'er that high festival. A thousand cups of gold in Judah's deemed divine. 
Jehovah's vessels hold the godless heathen's wine. This is curious language. Belshazzar drank it in front of them, it says. This was actually out of the ordinary. Very often, there would be like a VIP section, a special room reserved for the king and the royal family, his, his concubines, and maybe some other important officials, but not here. No, the, the king is drinking and partying along with everyone else in full view. It must have been quite an event. Verse 2, Belshazzar, when he tasted the wine, commanded that the vessels of gold and of silver that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, or if you will, grandfather, more literally, had taken out of the temple in Jerusalem, be brought that the king and his lords, his wives and his concubines might drink from them. Then they brought in the golden vessels that had been taken out of the temple, the house of God in Jerusalem, and the king and his lords, his wives and his concubines drank from them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Think about the sacrilege, the blasphemy that this represents. Remember, for example, Aaron, the priest, and his sons, the, the Levites, the care with which they would enter into the presence of God in the temple. How fastidious they were in observing the various cleansing rituals. Why? Because God is holy. And now Belshazzar is distributing these, these cups, these vessels to his friends. And like party animals, they were, they're holding it up as they drink the libations. The fact that these vessels were not melt, melted down at the beginning suggests that they recognize them as sacred. And so what's happening here is an act of rebellion. Belshazzar is waving his fist in the face of Israel's God, saying, I am the mighty one. I am the sovereign who will drink from your sacred vessels. What was motivating the king? Well, it may have been driven by political purposes. He may be trying to rally the troops, as it were, because his father, Nabonidus, had just suffered a crushing defeat a few miles north. They understood that the Persians were coming down to the capital city. And so he gathers around all the important people, and he uses these vessels as a way of toasting his gods, of remembering the victories from bygone days a way to beat their chest, as it were, and say, no one can defeat us. Well, we shall see. It may have looked, it must have looked so very impressive from the outside. All of this power, all of this wealth, and yet the bottom is about to fall out. Verse 5, this is the second principle. If we forget the past we will inevitably repeat our mistakes. Immediately, the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace opposite the lampstand. And the king saw the hand as it wrote. There's a long history of hands in the Bible and in the ancient world. We think of uh, first. Samuel chapter 5 is that story of uh, Dagon, the Philistine statue that is in front of the Ark of the Covenant and uh, confronted by the presence of God. He falls down prostrate, the statue does, and when he falls, the head comes off as do the hands. It wasn't uncommon in certain times and places to remove the hand of your enemy when you defeated them in battle in order to demonstrate that you are the victor. It was a way of actually counting the number of people that you defeated. But this is no lifeless hand. <laughs> it is very much alive. It is moving and has a rather noticeable effect on Belshazzar. Verse 6, then the king's color changed and his thoughts alarmed him. He, he is absolutely terrified 
and there is an immediate change, much like Nebuchadnezzar when he walked upon his rooftop and gave that, uh, that ode to himself, look at my kingdom, what I have done for my glory, and at once he's turned into a beast. So now, in his pride, Belshazzar sees the hand, and he is undone. So what does the king do about it? He does what everyone would do in such a moment. He becomes religious, right? Think of 9-11. Think of how much the churches were filled or the spring of 2020. When our life is falling apart, we naturally look heavenward for help. And so he calls for his enchanters. Verse 7, he called loudly to bring them, the enchanters, the Chaldeans, and the astrologers. The king declared to the wise men of Babylon, whoever reads this writing and shows me its interpretation shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around his neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. He's a little bit like Vito Corleone here. He's giving them an offer they can't refuse. And it's not just bling, you see. The chain is an emblem of authority. It would have elevated someone's social status. The, the color purple supports that. Purple was the color of royalty. Being made third in the kingdom would rank the successful prophet just below him and his father, Nebuchadnezzar, Belshazzar, and whoever offers the explanation. So, how do you think it goes? <laughs> We've seen this before, haven't we? Verse 8, then all the king's wise men came in, but it's a wonder they're still in business, but they could not read the writing or make known to the king the interpretation. Then King Belshazzar was greatly alarmed, and his color changed, and his lords were perplexed. The king is quite possibly peeing his pants at this moment. I mean, he's utterly inebriated. He was absolutely frightened before. Now he's worse than that. You can only imagine. Who can possibly help him? His mother, the queen mother. Verse 10, the queen, because of the words of the king and his lords, came into the banqueting hall, and the queen declared, O king, live forever. Let not your thoughts alarm you or your color change. Get it together, son. Settle down, me laddie. Everything's going to be okay, says mom. Now, if Herodotus, the Greek historian, is right, this was Queen Nitocris. Again, quite likely the daughter of Nebuchadnezzar. She doesn't play a big role in this story, but a very important one. She's, she's a bit like Naaman's servant girl in 2 Kings 5, you know, who provides the explanation they needed. Look, there's a prophet. There is someone who can help you. Verse 11, there is a man in your kingdom, she says, in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. In the days of your father, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, made him chief of the magicians, enchanters, Chaldeans, and astrologers, because an excellent spirit, knowledge, and understanding to interpret dreams, explain riddles, and solve problems were found in this Daniel whom the king named Belteshazzar. Now let Daniel be called, and he will show you the interpretation. Again, we see this phrase, spirit of the gods, plural. They didn't quite get it in Babylon, and that is, of course, how it is. John Calvin said that the human heart is an idol-producing factory. Right? We, we just mass-produce all of the things that we will bow down before, short of God. So they call in Daniel. He was about 57 years old when Nebuchadnezzar died, which makes him now 80. So his face is creased from the hot Mesopotamian sun. His hair is likely gray, and, and yet he's still strong. He is God's servant. And I want to take this opportunity to, to make a simple point for those of you who are a little bit older. I remember when I was at the Moody Bible Institute 
One of my professors, Ron Sauer, said, it's not until you are 65 and older that you will make your greatest contribution for the kingdom. What was I, 24, 25 at the time? I couldn't quite get my mind around that. It didn't make complete sense, but I'll tell you what, looking back upon it now in my 50s, I see it. It's true that, that as he put it, so much of what you do in those, long, those younger years, excuse me, is preparation for the person you will be and the things you will do when you're older. Daniel's 80, and he is still in the midst of a fruitful ministry. Some of his greatest chapters of life are still in front of him. And so I want to give a word of encouragement to those of you who are older. What, what do we call it? Senior saints. Um, our world tells us just retire at a certain age. Well, retirement's fine. My youngest son's nine years old. It'll be a long time before I'm there, but that's a good thing, retirement. But then it says, so, you know, move to Florida, move to North Carolina and collect seashells. Goodness gracious, please don't collect seashells, whatever you do. God wants to use us to change the world in Jesus' name, to make a contribution that has eternal significance, my friend. D Daniel was 80 years old. Let's not forget that. Verse 13. Then Daniel was brought in before the king. The king answered and said to Daniel, You are that Daniel, one of the exiles of Judah, whom the king my father brought from Judah. There's a note of disrespect here, right? There's so much that Belshazzar might have said about Daniel. Let's remember, Daniel had been elevated to an important place in the kingdom, right? We read about it in chapter 2 in verse 48, where it says, Then Nebuchadnezzar gave Daniel high honors and many great gifts and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief prefect over all the wise men of Babylon. But how does Belshazzar describe him? One of the exiles of Judah, a slave. You see how derisive he is here. Verse 14, I have heard of you that the spirit of the gods is in you and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom are found in you. Now the wise men, the enchanters, have been brought in before me to read this writing and make known to me its interpretation, but they could not show the interpretation of the matter. But I have heard that you can give interpretations and solve problems. Now, if you can read the writing and make known to me its interpretation, you shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around your neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. It feels a little bit like Groundhog's Day, doesn't it? I mean, it's, it's not the interpretation of a dream. Now it's the interpretation of the handwriting, but it's the same story. And among the insights we gather from this, I think, is the importance of remembering. Wow, we forget so easily. In Hebrew, zakar, Israel is told over and over again, remember your bondage in Egypt. Remember how the Lord has saved you with outstretched arm. Remember that you are the apple of his eye. I get up here and preach most weeks. It seems to me that seldom am I, am I telling you something you don't already know, new information. Most of what I do, what we do as preachers, is to remind one another of this truth. And so we do that. We do that as a body. We do that in the fellowship hall after worship time, where we, we talk to one another about what God has been doing in our lives. That's a way of remembering, right? I say this over and over again. When you wake up in the morning and you make your coffee and your tea, do that first. Make your drink. If you're one of those people who don't need such a drink, God bless you. We're all just his mind in life. Remember. And that leads to the third principle. The condition of our heart determines the outcome. Verse 17 then Daniel answered and said before the king, let your gifts be for yourself and give your reward to another. 
Nevertheless, I will read the writing to the king and make known to him the interpretation. Daniel wasn't being rude. He was probably wanting to make it clear that God's services could not be bought. They're not a commodity. Verse 18, O king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar your father kingship and greatness and glory and majesty, and because of the greatness that he gave him, all peoples, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him. Whom he would, he killed, and whom he would, he kept alive. Whom he would, he raised up, and whom he would, he humbled. So he starts with a bit of a reprimand. He reminds Belshazzar that authority is derived. God is the source. It doesn't emerge from any person, from the human heart or volition. It's, it's given as a sacred trust. And by the way, that's true for all of us. If you are a, a mom or a dad, if you're a young person who's a captain of a, of a ball team, if it's in the workplace where you own your business or you're a manager, God has put you there and calls you to steward authority in a way that serves others, in a way that contributes to the common good. Belshazzar needed to be reminded. Verse 20. But when Nebuchadnezzar's heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened so that he dealt proudly, he was brought down from his kingly throne and his glory was taken from him. He was driven from among the children of mankind and his mind was made like that of a beast and his dwelling was with wild donkeys. He was fed grass like an ox and his body was wet with the dew of heaven until he knew that, you remember this phrase, that the most high God rules the kingdom, the kingdom of mankind and sets over it whom he will. We saw this three times last week. It's, it is the focal point. There is one king, there is one throne, there is one Lord, and I'm sorry, Belshazzar, you are not that one. Verse 22, and you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, though you knew all of this, but you have lifted up yourself against the Lord of heaven. If you're the kind of person who likes to make notes in your Bible, if you like to underline verses, this is a good section to underline, these two verses, 22 and 23. Should have known. Hmm? Remember chapter 4 and verse 1, um, Nebuchadnezzar wrote down his decree, his declaration of the Lord's sovereignty. Belshazzar was old enough. We believe his mother was the daughter of Nebuchadnezzar. He should have understood. And the vessels of his house, Daniel continues to say, have been brought in before you, and you and your lords and your wives and your concubines have drunk wine from them. And you have praised the gods of silver and gold, and bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which do not see or hear or know. But the God in whose hand is your breath, and whose are all your ways, you have not honored. This is the Romans 1 of the Old Testament, right? God gives these gifts. He gives us the very breath that we breathe. And what a privilege it is to be alive and to recognize the God of creation and the God of salvation. But instead of praising him, what was Belshazzar doing? He was committing himself to idolatry. He was worshiping the, the false gods of stone and silver and gold. And here, again, is a lesson for us. Education does not equal transformation. Belshazzar had a great deal of knowledge. He was exposed to the reality of what the Lord had done in his grandfather Nebuchadnezzar's life. He knew it, but it didn't change him. And so it is for us. We might come week after week and you patiently sit there and you listen to whoever is speaking from up here. Maybe you go to Sunday school and you're part of a growth group. You're, you're getting all of this knowledge. That's great. We believe 
that theology matters. If you don't understand who God is, then there's no way you can follow him. But look, it's not enough to be a fathead, you see? It's not enough just to have doctrinal content between your ears. It has to make its way down into the heart and bring about conviction and inspiration. That's what Belshazzar was missing. And so what was the verdict? What was the outcome? Verse 24. Then from his presence, the hand was sent, and this writing was inscribed. And this is the writing that was inscribed. Mene, Mene, Tekel, and Parson. This is the interpretation of the matter. Mene, God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balance and found wanting. Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. What's the verdict for the king? It's the same verdict that anyone receives when he says, my kingdom come, instead of saying, thy kingdom come. He will now reap the consequences of his idolatry. Mene, your days are numbered. There's a finite amount of time you have been given, Belshazzar, and you have chosen to use that on yourself instead of giving God the glory. How instructive is this for us? All of us in this room have a finite amount of time that God has ordained. Huh? 23 years have passed like that in our story. Isn't that how it goes? You wake up one day, you look in the mirror, Mama Mia, how did we get here so fast? Right? That's life. What are we doing with our time? Tekel, verse 27, means weighed. 1 Samuel 2.3 puts it this way. The Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. Imagine a scale, right? And here's God's righteousness on one side, what Paul calls the glory of God in Romans 3. And here's our life. There's no way we can measure up. We all fall short. And that is, of course, why God gave his son Jesus so that we would conform to his holy standard. And thirdly, parson. There's a play on words here. Parson means divided. Perez means Persian. In other words, the kingdom is divided and will be given to the Persians. So how did the king respond? Was he like the king of Nineveh, who's convicted by his sin, who tore his clothing and put on sackcloth and and called all of his kingdom to do the same in repentance? Well, sadly and tragically not. Verse 29. Then Belshazzar gave the command. Daniel was clothed with purple. A chain of gold was put around his neck, and a proclamation was made about him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. Tragically, he didn't get the message as they say, uh, I say this all the time. My kids roll their eyes every time I say it. Uh, uh, <laughs> now you're going to laugh at me that I forgot this. Denial is not simply a river in Egypt. If ever a joke fell flat, that was it. Wow. Come on, Dad. Put the joke to rest already. This is what happens when we resist God. We become like the clay in the hot sun. Our hearts become hard. Huh? Scripture is so clear about this. Proverbs 29, 1. He who is often reproved, yet stiffens his neck, will suddenly be broken beyond healing. Or Hebrews 3, 15. Today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Or Jesus' parable of the soils. You've got the hard soil and the, you know, the seed just sits on top and the birds come and they take it away compared to the good soil that receives the seed. Indeed, the condition of our heart determines the outcome of life. And then finally, as we draw to a close, the last principle. Our decisions have ultimate consequences. Verse 30. That very night, Belshazzar the Chaldean was killed, and Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. The
the final verse is just chilling. You know, the, the walls around Babylon were 320 feet high. They were 80 feet thick, can you imagine? They had enough food for three years, and the river Euphrates ran underneath it in an aqueduct. aqueduct. So Belshazzar and everyone else thought they were safe, but they weren't. Darius redirected that river so that his commandos were able to enter underneath the city, the water being about mid-thigh deep. And they went in and they defeated uh, citizens and soldiers who inhabited the outer ring of the temple. And then they just made their way toward the center. And before long, they were victorious. It went from a feast to an invasion, and then suddenly it was an execution. This is the end of Belshazzar. I was talking with one of our elders this past week, Dan Master, about this, and uh, we were discussing the, the Christian notion of imminence. You know, at any moment, we might face the end of life. That's just how it goes. Jesus might call us home. Jesus might return. We find ourselves confronted with the living God. So what do we do? How do we live in light of that? That's the question I want to ponder as we close. Mene Tekel Parson. What do you suppose would have happened if Belshazzar had humbled himself? If he had been like his grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar, recognized his sinfulness, if he had lifted his gaze to see that God alone is glorious, how would things have been different in this story? I don't know. Maybe he would have been like the thief on the cross. Remember him? There he is beside Jesus, and everyone around him is heaping scorn upon the dying Savior, and by God's grace, he sees something different in this dying Galilean. He sees his compassion and his mercy that somehow as Jesus was being crucified, he's looking out for others. He directs John, his apostle, to care for his mother. By God's grace, he asks for forgiveness. He says, remember me when you're in your Father's kingdom. What did Jesus look like in that moment? To the eyes of most people, he looked pathetic. But through the eyes of faith, he was the beautiful Savior. I started this sermon by saying things are not always what they appear to be. And so I want to close by talking to that person who is perhaps here today. You've heard about Jesus. And you, you see him in the same light that most people have seen him through history. He's pathetic. I want to tell you that that Savior who died on the cross came for a specific reason. He came to die for your sins. That God loves you so much that he sent his son to die on the cross, a debt that you could never pay, a penalty you could never bear. And he took all of your sin and wrongdoing and rebellion and he put it there upon him, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's why he came. But my friends, the story doesn't end there. Because God, after three days, raised his son from the grave to the heights of heaven. Hallelujah. Give me an amen, Bob. Give me, come on, come on. He's at the heights of heaven, and right now he stands with outstretched arms inviting all of humanity to come to himself. Our story does not have to end like Belshazzar's. Our story can end in redemption. So if you're that person today, I don't know who you are, I'm going to pray now. I invite you to pray with me. Let's pray. Oh, Lord God, how we love the grapes of Santa Rosa. But we understand there are often things happening that we don't comprehend. 
And that's why we pray now that you would give us wisdom and give us mercy to recognize your steadfast love in and through your Son. So for anyone here today who's not yet embraced him, please provide the grace to do so so that we all may stand together and declare that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen.